Hello, everyone. I'm, um, I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about um, people and medicinal plants and how evolutionary tools can tell us about medicinal plant diversity and help us understand medicinal plant diversity better. I'm less happy about coming without my slides. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is an appalling situation um, that's linked to my daughter starting secondary school today. And she appeared in my room at two o'clock in the morning to discuss her fears and anxieties for an hour. <laughs> and, and then I slept fitfully until six in the morning, having a nightmare that I'd bought her the wrong school uniform. And woke, did a few minor changes to my slides so they were perfect, saved them on a, on, emailed them to myself and saved them on a um, stick so that I'd be sure to have them. And I had emailed and saved the wrong version. So... Oh. But I had bought the right school uniform. So, <laughs> huge relief. <laughs> oh, gosh. So I'm going to talk to you about medicinal plants and evolutionary tools for studying medicinal plants um, using this flip chart. <laughs> um, how many medicinal plants do you think there are? If you think there are between 1 and 10,000, 10,000 and 20,000, more? Higher? Lower? Higher, higher. higher, higher. 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 Yes. <laughs> um, what's interesting is we don't have a really good audit of plants that are used in medicine traditionally by the diverse people of diverse cultures who have their own ethnopharmacopoeias or sets of medicinal plants, which we sometimes call medicinal floras. So there's, um, there are estimates, a very nice estimate was put forward in this room a couple of, um, two years ago, State of the World's Plants, but there's still lots of work to be done about how many plants there are, and ethnobotanists are still describing plants that are used in communities um, for the first time, so we're still getting new records of plants with medicinal use. Um, nevertheless, the work of ethnobotanists till now has provisioned a huge amount of data about the plants that are used by people in different cultures for different therapeutic uses, and also data about how they use them. So are they, um, what part of the plant is used, um, what the therapeutic application of those plants are, so what, what illnesses are, are being treated, and um, the mode of, of uh, preparation of the plants and the way in which the plants are administered. So there is actually rather a lot of data, even though we're looking at estimates that could be much more robust. So I'm an evolutionary biologist, and for the last 10 years, I've been thinking about using evolutionary tools to delve into um, this business of um, medicinal plant diversity. And I suppose what I want to talk about today is who knows what. And I'm going to talk about that the who I'm talking about are people who represent diverse um, ethno-linguistic groups or cultures, and also the ethno-pharmacologists, pharmacologists and um, plant phytochemists, plant biochemists, who screen plants looking for drugs. Because medicinal plants, as well as providing um, the primary and perhaps only healthcare for millions of people in the world today, they are also um, a source of new leads for drug development. So, for example, World Health Organization tells us that a quarter of current drugs are, are from natural sources, um, from plants. And whilst there's been um, the pendulum swings on whether looking to plants for new leads and new drugs is a really, really good idea, or a complete waste of time, or politically impossible, or actually achievable if we follow the CBD in the right way. That pendulum swings backwards and forwards, um, but still people are um, interested in the um, plants as drugs. And what's, of course, with so many millions of people relying on plants for their health care, there's some sort of ethical responsibility, I think, to look at the safety and, um, and the efficacy of the plants that are used. So, I'm interested in evolutionary tools, I'm interested in evolutionary questions, and I was going to show you the results of four studies, and I'm still going to talk you through those. 
The first study I want to talk to you about is uh, it's a little bit old now, but it sets the scene because it was my first sort of foray into um, using evolutionary tools to think about medicinal plants. And I call this the Three Floras paper. And um, that's my shorthand for it. But it's a paper that was published in 2011. Harris Saslis Lagudakis, working with me, was the first author. And it's a paper that compares the medicinal floras of three uh, sort of regions or countries um, that were New Zealand, South Africa, uh, the Cape of South Africa, I should say, and Nepal. And what we did was, was we built a comprehensive phylogeny of the plants of those three areas. And then with the phylogeny that represented the total flora, we were able to test for um, whether there were preferred lineages in each of the three places. So are people using the same plant? Are, are people using certain lineages of plants more than others? Are there preferred lineages in each of the three places? But also, we could test and see whether the preferred lineages were the same lineages in the three places. And to do that, we use the community phylogenetic tools that measure the distance between sets of plants. Um, I'm actually miming a phylogenetic tree now. This is my phylogenetic <laughs> tree. And I'm measuring from one sample to another sample. And you can do that overall for many samples and get an estimate of, of the relatedness of, of the samples. And doing that, we found something rather interesting, which was... Firstly, that medicinal plants in the three places were all belonged to clusters or preferred lineages, as I call them. And secondly, that the lineages were the same between the three places. That was interesting. And it was interesting what the reaction to that finding was. Because on the one hand, we had people saying, well, of course, because people are exposed to different species, different genera, but actually the phytochemistry is rather well conserved. So when people are choosing these same lineages, what they are doing are accessing the same phytochemistry, and they've independently discovered that phytochemistry in those lineages, even though they're not meeting the same species, and this points towards efficacy. So, and for some people, that was like, whoa, well, we hadn't really thought that we would um, find, find this kind of evidence of share independent discovery of efficacy. Um, and for other people, well, of course, of course we expect to find this independent discovery of efficacious lineages. There's no surprises there. People have an intimate relationship with the plant resources that they exploit, and that intimate relationship means that over many generations of passing down knowledge, traditional knowledge, that, um, that the, the best plants are really well known. So that was, that was three floras, and it was interesting because it pointed to um, independent discovery. The next paper I want to talk to you about looked at different peoples. So we, we inferred independent discovery for these very geographically and culturally distant groups. But what happens when you look to people who are, if you like, more closely related? And we can estimate the relatedness of people using language phylogeny or language data so that we can say, for example, and this is, in, this is my second paper, it's Nepal, that there are two main lineage, ethno-linguistic lineages represented in T Nepal. We've got the Tibeto-Burmans, and we've got the Indo-European language speakers. And actually, Nepal is a fantastically culturally diverse place with many people speaking many languages and a, a history of on-the-ground ethno-botanical data collection. And thanks to um, work at RBGE, um, rather nice flora. So we know quite a lot about the medicinal plants, the plants, and the people of Nepal. And we were able to exploit that data to find out what people know when they're living in close proximity to each other. And how did we do that? We built the phylogeny of Nepal, Nepalese plants, and we had an estimation of how closely related different people in Nepal were and we had a list of the medicinal plants they used 
and we had knowledge of where the people lived and the plants that were around them and how closely they lived to other how closely they lived to other people and we our analysis allowed us to test whether the plants that any person used any cultural group of people use in Nepal are because of who they are so are you more likely to use similar plants to the people who speak similar languages to you, who you're closely related to? We could find out the impact of the floristic environment. I'm writing this in tiny letters. I'm really sorry about that. Um, the floristic environment. Get your binoculars out. Um, it's actually very difficult to see the green letters. Oh, shall I go to black? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got two colours. Great. Ancestry, that's probably worse. Floristic environment, or who you're near. And from the perspective of evolutionary anthropologists, um, these um, the, um, using plants that are m the, um, if the floristic environment is the main determinant of the plants you use. Um, we might call that adaptation. So people have moved around, um, but if they quickly start using the plants that are around them, that's adaptation. If, however, people hang on to the plants at the kind of time scale at which people in different ethno-linguistic ethno groups diverge, and you, you're using plants that are like your um, ethno-linguistic relatives, then ancestry would be the biggest determinant of medicinal plant use. Um, or maybe um, the way that knowledge spreads, it's a sort of word of mouth thing to the people who are near you. So we might find people who live in, clo in, in proximity or have opportunities to exchange knowledge um, use the most similar medicinal plants. So, which do you think it was? Ancestry. Which one? Ancestry. ancestry. You're going for ancestry. That is very interesting because we do have a narrative of how, what makes medicinal plants valuable. And that narrative was laid down by Richard Schultes way back in the 60s. And is that way back? That's how old I am. OK. <laughs> um, so he, um, he made the case that traditional knowledge is very much in place and it represents a sort of deep and long-term experimentation and that adds, that's what gives it its value, the fact that it represents this deep, long history. And what we found, actually, was that the floristic environment is, is the only significant determinant of what plants you use. So people in, in Nepal don't live to, next to their nearest neighbours. There's been different migrations and movements. But the plants they use are quickly... Um, they quickly adapt to the plants in their local environment in order to compile uh, medicinal flora or ethnopharmacopoeia, and there's no significant um, signal of ancestry in the plants that are used. And this, to me, is, you know, that's the, that's the big news. Like, the big news here was that um, people are finding the same lineages. The big news here is that people are really adapting a lot. And in, in the literature of cultural anthropology and cultural evolution, people talk about um, the idea that um, very significant um, characters, so this might be of material culture or, um, um, for example, um, may change more slowly, whereas more decorative, I can't I'm getting this right, I'm looking at Fiona at the back, who's my cultural anthropology collaborator, um, whereas things like the decorative aspects of material culture might change more quickly. And we were thinking, well, medicinal plants, that's surely right, really deeply fundamental to your health, to your survival, to your well-being, that's going to be stable, it's going to be constrained by ancestry, but that is not what we find. So that was kind of quite exciting, actually, very exciting. So the next step was to say, well, we've done that for Nepal. How about choosing a very different case study and having a go to see if we get, um, if we get a similar kind of story? And the third paper I was going to tell you about is called Polynesia. 
that's my shorthand for it. I know everyone has a shorthand for their papers, and they, uh, you probably refer to your paper as the Nepal paper or whatever, and forget what the actual title is, but it's... <laughs> so this paper is called the Polynesia paper, and, and this one is one that we've just submitted. And what, what we did here was investigate a situation where there's really quite different... Um, scenario of human diversification, ethno-linguistic diversification and migration. So the, pol the, the peopling of Polynesia is one of the most remarkable migrations in human history. And the sites that are occupied by the Polynesian people are often remote. And they often reflect floristic environments that are quite different to the, if you like, the ancestral floristic environment, so people arriving in New Zealand might find a different floristic environment. And there's, there's a lot of sort of very interesting narratives around the relationship between Polynesian people and plants. So you may have heard of the canoe plants, so the idea that, that significant plants were transported by canoe, to, and so that you take your, your plant survival kit with you on these amazing migrations. Um, but there's no mention in any of that sort of, um, in any of the literature about canoe plants of medicinal plants. So were medicinal plants, were medicinal plants, um, was there ancestral knowledge of medicinal plants that was re retained in this scenario? We first of all, we used the same methods as we used in Nepal, which is basically build a, get a people tree, so there's a language tree for Polynesian peoples. Um, get um, floristic data from checklists from the places where the people are living, get the ethnomedicinal data from um, anthropologists, so we've got checklists of what plants are used, how they use the therapeutic applications, mode of preparation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and build a phylogeny of all the plants. So we did that. And we basically used matrix methods. Oh, I'm, oh wow, amazing, I can really talk. So um, they, we used matrix methods to test whether um, plants that the, the relatedness of the medicinal floras was best explained by ancestry, floristic environment, or proximity as, an, as a measure of likelihood of exchanging knowledge. Again, the floristic environment. But we, th we thought, well, let's delve into this a little bit more, I don't I'm speed up now, a little bit more, and let's try and see if we can understand whether there is any signal of ancestral knowledge in the data. And a PhD student, uh, Irena Texidor Tenno, and I have written about what how would you, what are the criteria for identifying ancestral knowledge? And we've proposed that you could use an ethno-linguistic phylogeny of peoples and um, make an ancestral reconstruction to estimate whether knowledge is ancestral or not. Um, and in the Polynesian paper, what we've done um, is we've looked to um, reconstruct whether the plant species are used or not, what plant part is used, what the therapeutic application is, and we've also considered the cognate, so what people call these things. And in the Polynesian situation, where we've got a very, very, very strong um, signal of the floristic environment, we do find some evidence of putatively ancestral knowledge very exciting to find that there could be plants that represent this knowledge. Um, so we've got 22 plants that reconstruct based on use, plant part, therapeutic, ap therapeutic application, and the other thing I said. And we've got um, two of those that also find cognate names. So it's a very exciting and novel way of drilling into um, the evolution of medicinal knowledge, which I think challenges some views about the relationship between people and plants in seeking, in seeking medicines. Thank you very much for your patience and everything. <laughs>